Uh, my talk will actually have two parts. Uh, the first one will be backward looking and will focus on uh, EU imagination and distinguish between um, who is actually doing the imagining uh, at different times in the EU's history. Uh, and the second part will then do justice to the title, to some extent at least, um, and focus on, um, um, on the topic of uh, looking forward uh, new imaginaries. So, if we talk about one important uh, thing to keep in mind that when we think about the history uh, of the EU, um, and we ask, well, who's doing the imagining uh, with, regard to, um, with regard to the EU and what it is in the period lasting up until the mid-80s? Then the answer is, this is a very limited kind of enterprise. The people who do the imagination are, uh, are those directly involved in it, certain technocratic elites, uh, and um, EU lawyers, uh, EC law specialists, who are, who, are, who are studying this as part of their, the core professional field. The way this was institutionalized at the law faculties was that there were international lawyers typically who also covered EU law, even though from early on there were already a couple of Jean Monnet chairs that focused specifically just uh, on uh, EC law. But the point was this was neither in the political imagination of um, the wider public uh, nor in terms of legal education and the legal imagination uh, mainstream in any significant way. With other words, think about, um, so the legal point in terms of the legal imagination, think about the fact that uh, up until the mid-80s, late-80s, there is, uh, according to the research done by one of my research assistants last week, um, not a single jurisdiction in the European Union which made the study of EU law part of a requirement for the study of law up until the mid-80s. Mm -hmm. By the mid-90s, all that had changed. Um, and in most jurisdictions, EU law had become part of the basic courses mm -hmm. that in, as part of your legal education to qualify as a lawyer uh, you would take. Something significantly changes uh, there that wasn't there previously. Also think about in political terms. Um, when we think about the uh, pol politics in the 60s and 70s, the great the student movements, the left uh, energized, um, uh, um, all of these, the, the big political debates, they were about war and peace and about the social transformation of society. EU did not focus, did not play a significant role in those political struggles. It didn't inform the political imagination of the core actors at the time. It remained a little niche, technocratic, uh, legalistic uh, kind of uh, project. Now, of course, there were certain high moments, uh, even in that, uh, high political moments, even in that period. If you think, if you go back early, the empty chair politics of de Gaulle, or then early on in the 80s, Margaret Thatcher going to Brussels wanting her money back. You know, so there are the, those individual moments, and occasionally on TV you saw images of wine lakes and butter mountains uh, as a, signa, a sign of the failure uh, of, the, um, of, the, of the community's agricultural policies, but that was really the extent of it. So the first phase of the history of the EU uh, we have to think of as a very a limited one in terms of who does the imagining. It's a, it's a small circle. Uh, of actors. Now that changes uh, in the 90s, uh, or it changes somewhere, I don't want to put a date to it, but somewhere between the single European Act and the Maastricht uh, Treaty, there's a shift. Now the significance of this shift um, uh, is concerns, I think, primarily the legal academy and a legal practice. So it's the lawyers that now appropriate EU law, not the citizens, uh, the lawyers. And if you ask why do the lawyers appropriate EU law, why is it becoming mainstream uh, to study it, why is it becoming a part of a compulsory program, is that all of a sudden some of the basic categories that you normally associate with the constitutional tradition, citizenship um, most specifically, um, and majoritarian decision making, which of course already existed as a peripheral phenomenon, uh, early on, but became much more central after the single European Act and then formalized in the Maas Treaty of Maastricht. All of, this, uh, all of this suggested that there was something going on and there was a potential, a political significance, a legal significance attached to the EU, which requires, uh, e which requires public lawyers uh, 
um, uh, to think about this uh, in critical or in some terms. You needed to have an account of it. And of course, um, if you ask what are the core legal high moments um, in, 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 the, in the early 90s that kind of uh, can provide, uh, that can prov uh, no, it's not Christian. Um, <laughs> oh, you were you were talking about your phone, not about my. <laughs> uh, actually, both. <laughs> Nicely ambiguous. Um, uh, uh, two more. Uh, the, it's the publication of of Weiler's transformation of Europe as a as kind of early on in the 90s uh, reflects this moment. Doesn't induce it. It's not causal for it. It reflects it. Um, as does the Maastricht decision in many ways. Uh, it reflects this new sensibility that all of a sudden, it's not that there weren't earlier judgments by the German Constitutional Court or other courts uh, on EU law, but they were received by, you know, certain, by, by those who were professionally engaged with EU law. They were not generally studied as a fundamental to constitutional law and the understanding of constitutionalism more generally. That shifted uh, in the early 90s and the Maastricht decision is an indication reflects this new sensibility. Um, and of course, the moment that happens, the moment we have um, a mainstreaming, if you like, um, of EU law as part of the general public law curriculum, as part of the general world of law, um, what we study and what is studied in constitutional law classes, what is focused on, uh, is as, a, as the conflict, the conflict of authority between EU law and national law and how to manage that doctrinally. Uh, and how to justify the different kind of solutions uh, that have been found. So that becomes a core political, that becomes a core legal uh, focal point um, uh, for public attention and also scholarship. And the whole language of constitutional pluralism ultimately that evolved uh, was uh, a language which focused on the structure, uh, um, the doctrinal structure and the interaction of the European Court of Justice and Ape national apex courts. Uh, and, and are ultimately uh, issues of conflicting authority claims and how to construct the relevant authority of these uh, re relevant actors. Okay, so that's kind of the story of the, this, is, this, is, this happens in the 90s with the, uh, with the with where the, for the first time the EU is confronted um, with um, questions relating to its basic legitimacy and what is clear from the get-go is that somehow its legitimacy has to be justified, if it is to be justified, in constitutionalist terms. Because we know what legitimate government looks like. By the 90s, there is a dominant, dominant understanding that constitutions, if they are to be legitimate, have to fit some version of a liberal democratic paradigm. Um, there can be plenty of variations. There are variations of uh, liberal democratic constitutionalism, but it has to qualify somehow as that type of uh, an entity if to, to be legitimate nationally. So that's the, that's the early 90s. And if, that's, if we understand legitimate authority as somehow connected to a commitment and the adequate institutionalization of a commitment to human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, and the appropriate market structures uh, that function adequately for, that, for such a society, um, then the question is how we make sense of the European Union. Uh, in those terms. And that, that creates the basic structure for the debates, the basic tensions for the debates that would then uh, ensue. Now comes the third part of the historical story. Um, because there is once again a, a shift in the question of who imagines the EU constitution. So it's, it's a constitutional lawyers, public lawyers project to a large extent in the 90s. It's not just a technocratic set of experts. It becomes a wider group of administrative lawyers, constitutional lawyers, public lawyers, uh, and of course private lawyers too, uh, given um, the structure, given what the EU, what EU law does. It becomes a, a so those who do the imagining are mostly lawyers. Um, now, that shifts again um, in the 21st century. And now there's some debate about uh, uh, where you would put the shift. One potential candidate is, if you, if you ask uh, Habermas, it would be um, um, the American invasion, um, the American war against Iraq. I think that's not right. That doesn't really focus on Europe and the EU. Uh, in uh, too meaningful a way, at least doesn't have that kind of resonance over time. I actually also don't think it was the failed 
a constitutional moment, which really was never a constitutional moment because it wasn't about anything that warrants calling it a constitutional moment uh, relating to the constitutional treaty and its ratification. That was a highly artificial and contrived um, uh, um, moment, uh, which when it failed just went on in the form of a Lisbon Treaty, which is exactly what you'd expect if there wasn't a constitutional moment to begin with. Uh, so, uh, so that's not the moment, uh, the relevant time either, I think. What it is is ultimately the financial, um, the banking crisis, which then became a sovereign debt crisis. That's a moment, and the, and the consequences connected to that. Uh, the transfers that were organized through the ESM, um, the treaty change that all of a sudden became possible, even though people said nothing, we can't do any treaty amendments, etc. It's impossible. Yes, it was. We did that. Article 136 was quickly done, quickly pushed through. Things are possible when they need to be. Um, and so, and then there's the consequences, all the, all the austerity measures, um, the Troika, uh, and the whole politics surrounding uh, that drama, that led to a full-blooded politicization uh, of uh, European Union, what it, in effect are European Union policies. And from there on, if we ask how do we imagine the EU constitution, or the, uh, what are the EU's, how to imagine the EU, it's pr appropriate to think of this as being embedded in, or the different ways to imagine it, to be embedded in wider public debates and reflected in wider public debates and as part of the public imagination. So it's now taken away from the lawyers uh, and it's become uh, the concern of a wider public sphere uh, of citizens uh, more generally. And it's the financial crisis and then followed by the refugee crisis um, uh, uh, that was responsible for this. And for the first time there were political movements which focused pri primarily and they were successful nationally as political movements, focusing on EU, lot to EU topics. That's what, the, what Le Pen did, that's what in Germany the AfD is doing. Um, I, it's a more complicated story with regard to Poland and Hungary. Uh, their domestic mm -hmm. concerns were actually in the foreground, even though uh, the EU uh, was relevant as well uh, within the political agenda, but it was not foregrounded. But it is foregrounded uh, in uh, places like uh, France and uh, Germany. And that's, that's, that's remarkable, that's something new. That shows the kind of, you might say, um, the political maturity at least of, the, of imagining uh, the EU, whatever the substance of it may be. Okay, that's that much about the three uh, periods, uh, kind of a reductive uh, account of, the, uh, of a, the three periods about who does the imagining. Um, in European uh, history. Um, now, as I've said, uh, basically from the 90s onwards, uh, if we asked, well, what is, how do we imagine uh, the EU? What are the constitutional, uh, what is the EU's imagination? Then I think Jan has chosen intuitively, um, he's made a strong assumption, uh, which I think is a correct one to make, which is it has to be constitutional imagination. Uh, so from the 1990s onwards, we ca if we imagine the EU as anything that might be legitimate, we have to imagine it um, through some kind of a constitutionalist uh, frame. That means a frame that ultimately, as is reflected in Article 2, takes as basic a commitment to human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. We have to imagine it in that way somehow. Otherwise, we can imagine it a different way, but then we have to, we have to be critical against it. So it's, there's... There's a reason why the imagination of the EU doesn't, it does not, is not a constitutional imagination by those anti-European car parties. They don't imagine it um, uh, in constitutional terms. Um, they uh, imagine it exclusively in either technocratic uh, or imperial um, uh, terms. And as such, of course, it's illegitimate and we have to uh, radically think about, at the very least, um, narrowing its power uh, or perhaps even abolishing it. Um, but if we imagine it uh, as something that in some ways is worthy at least of reform, we don't have to endorse it as it is, but it's worthy as a project to continue, then we have to imagine it. Uh, that reflects the time, uh, and that reflects the basic commitments that are uh, widely held. And we have to imagine it as somehow being responsive to and, be, and reflecting an institutionalization of a commitment of uh, human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. Now, if we do that, and um, then what, given the contemporary circumstances, how might more concretely uh, 
uh, such an imagination um, be connected uh, to the EU as, um, within a, as an emancipatory uh, project. Because of course the constitutionalist imagination is always connected with an emancipatory, or, or has historically, traditionally, uh, been connected to um, the kind of French American revolutionary uh, emancipatory projects, even if um, they tended in the, from the 19th and 20th century onwards not to be revolutionary very often, but reformist. Um, but an idea of an idea of, of progress, of emancipation, um, was always uh, connected with the idea of constitutionalism, <laughs> at least in the European context in the 20th and early 21st century. Okay, so what might what are the core issues. And from a constitutionalist perspective, the present is, uh, and the crisis that we've gone through has shown three at least pathological, three core problems. Whatever the solutions to those problems might be, there's probably agreement on the identification of the problems. First, um, the problem connects to the uh, structure of the European Monetary um, uh, uh, Union, and in particular the role of the European Central Bank without being flanked uh, by appropriate uh, powers of the EU with regard to um, taxation uh, and redistribution social policy. Um, so, and there are all kinds of debates that exist how one might survive, how that tension might be uh, resolved, and they range from uh, giving up on the European Monetary Union in its present form, uh, uh, just renationalizing or dividing up the currency space, uh, etc. On the one hand, to uh, empowering the European Union to have uh, its to be able to raise taxes of its own and redistribute, mm -hmm. uh, so tax and spend, mm -hmm. um, in some way, typically in some subtle way, you know, not a full power to tax, but maybe only corporate tax or financial transaction yeah. tax or these types of things, and maybe not full blown social policy, but support for unemployment when unemployment in a certain region reaches a certain stage. There's supposed to be subsidy payments made by the EU to support the respective regions or states. So, so there are these types of ideas, but they're versions for my purposes of tax and spend. Um, secondly, the second kind of problem um, connects uh, to, uh, it's connected to the refugee crisis, uh, which is a crisis of a disconnect between, on the one hand, a commitment to open borders, at least within the Schengen space, uh, and on the other hand, the, the minimal, the relatively modest competences the EU has with regard to ensuring um, controlling the external borders uh, of the EU. So the idea of mutual trust in that, re that respect reflected in, in, in Dublin and, and other kinds of agreements has not shown to be uh, functioning uh, as, as it was hoped. And so the idea, the idea here too is, and this is the direction in which it's moving, is to, is to strengthen the European border forces. Frontex is really blooming right now. They're get, getting significantly more resources, employing a great many more people. And there are strong pressures at least to also think about Europeanizing, harmonizing the administrative procedures relating to refugee admission even uh, and processing uh, of refugees and distribution of refugees. But that's a highly politically contentious issue. Um, but it's, there, it's again, it's kind of a harmonization, a federalization, if you like, uh, of border control to some extent. Uh, allowing, and this is an important point, allowing European border control units to do something at the border with, with or without the consent of that state. So that not to be invited by that state, but to just do it, whether or not uh, there is a consent uh, by that state. Clearly you want to have cooperative structures, but the point is you legally might not have to require. Uh, there's no requirement, there's no veto right of the respective uh, state. So that's a kind of, that's a second kind of issue. And thirdly connected to it um, is the general, uh, uh, is, is the, uh, uh, issues relating to um, security um, in the EU, and security as it, as it relates um, to um, international affairs. So very specifically, if we ask just the refugee crisis and how, what caused it, what, how is it connected to something that the EU might play a more active role in? Well, the refugee crisis is connected uh, ultimately also to such things as the Iraq war. Uh, which created, um, the, which created, which which helped to create ISIS effectively in Syria, which led to the disintegration of the, or played a significant role uh, in leading to the disintegration of the Syrian state, which then created the refugee crisis. So these types of actions, the actions of foreign policy actors in the Middle East, 
uh, are directly relevant for core vital European concerns. And the European Union is not, or has been only to a very limited extent, an actor that is taking uh, a leading role um, uh, um, uh, in that context. That role has been left primarily to those with their own military capacities, in particular, of course, the United States, mm -hmm. and more recently also um, uh, of Russia, and of course the local regional hegemons, hegemons such as Saudi Arabia, Iran, or Turkey. So, Taking that into account and the decay of NATO, I mean, really think about it, not just the kind of spats between the transatlantic spats between the European Union and the United States, but there are actually, there's a re serious problem of, of uh, military engagement between Turkey as one of the NATO's members and the United States and Syria. Uh, so NATO is really, if, if we're serious about this, we have to recognize that NATO's traditional function in the post-war world uh, is coming to an end. Um, and um, given this constellation, given, uh, and given um, also the r rise of the role of military uh, actions on the, on NATO, on, uh, the Eastern, on, uh, with regard to Russia, its invasion of Crimea in the past, and the probability of further actions, uh, probably not in the Baltic states, but in the Ukraine um, sometime in the future, um, this is at least a serious concern, and the question is, is this the type of concern that the European Union wants to uh, trust the leadership of the United States as it has traditionally, uh, given it's deeply unstable uh, and somewhat war-prone um, uh, um, uh, orientation? So, with other words, um, there are strong reasons, or there's a strong concern here, that Europeans have, if they don't want to be simply dominated or left to that you know, left to pick up the pieces of one disaster after another. If they want to be an actor and shape um, the environment in which they have to organize their, 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 their lives, uh, then uh, it seems uh, as if there's a serious question here uh, whether uh, to uh, create serious uh, competencies on the level of the EU to be able to have the means to play. Uh, that role. So that's the third and the last core constitutional issue. Notice how in the present, unlike the 2005 situation, there is a real, in terms of the policy uh, tensions and the policy situations we are facing, there is, the, there is the substantive political grounding for what could be called a constitutional moment. Um, there are all kinds of other reasons to be skeptical of such a constitutional moment actually arising and even if it arose to take a productive direction. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, in some sense, in the, I have to conclude and end uh, by uh, saying, um, much in line with some of the talks that were given yesterday, that with regard to you know, how, do you, how do you get to a situation where we can imagine the serious debates about these issues and what to do in some kind of constitutional convention, etc., how would that be imaginable in the given uh, political context? I shrug my shoulders and uh, point to a wonderful Gary Larson cartoon, um, who, which depicted uh, some nerdy professor on a, on a, on a, in front of a chalkboard where there are lots of formulas and really sophisticated and complicated. Mm -hmm. And then he points to one point here and says, and here a miracle occurs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so this is a little bit the, the uh, situation, um, uh, uh, I think, uh, that we're in. So I have nothing to say about that. No, no. <laughs> so there's something, though, that uh, struck me when he was speaking that it's of course always very neat with these periods, you know, and yeah. it, it leads to what's one that is perhaps of particular interest for this crowd. But I, I just do wonder will the imaginations at the earlier states was that limited? I know from brilliant work of Cena, for, for instance, about federalism, that then I also know from other brilliant scholars, that of course you was imagined in certain federalist terms to begin with, which was then reimagined in certain supranationalist terms subsequently, also by Bag, interplay of uh, experts and lawyers and so on. I just, just wonder whether you can't find a little bit more of a, of a historical continuity in this way of slightly readdressing how you uh, imagine it. Yeah. And, um, and it, it, it comes back to the, the current situation where you know where you finally get your constitutional moment, whether it is also then not sort of the reoccurrence of some of those imaginaries, and I think it particularly about seeing this work about the federalism, because what you point to with the front and so on does lead us to think of those situations. You're not allowed to answer now, we'll take some more. You raise your hands again, we have so many.
<laughs> okay, I think we'll then do down down the road. Jan first. I think you have to be fairly brief here. Yes, <laughs> it's a, just a very short question uh, about the emancipatory ambition of European Union constitutionalism. <laughs> just can you say a little bit more about that? Mm -hmm. So how do you mean it? What kind of emancipation it is? Yeah. My, my question is a follow-up on, on Mikael's. I, I wonder in, in your classification of the actors doing the imagining, whether you kind of limited yourself to the actors whose vision became the hege hegemonic or mm. dominant one. Exactly. Okay. And um, no. what the implication of that is for your proposition of, of having <coughs> a moment of de deliberation or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. defining visions for now. Mm -hmm. uh, remark and a question. Um, the remark it, it, it is fascinating to hear your story, but isn't it very lawyer centric? I mean, yes, part of, <laughs> exactly. Uh, sorry, I'm the IR theorist <laughs> here on this table. But the EU uh, was lawyer centric. But also, you know, well, we did this book with OUP European Stories, where what we traced was the political philosopher's imagination and yeah. why it is that up to more, but especially the early 70s, you know, they just didn't focus at all, and it really waited for Maastricht. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a similar fascinating story there, and I really think we just need to intertwine, I mean, and it's just not, there's then political um, scientists and all the rest of it mm -hmm. among scholars, and yeah. then there's other types of imagination. So I just want to say around this table, let's not be too lawyer-centric. Okay. Uh, but, but I'm struck by the fact that you, when you look to the future, you give us policy prescriptions. You know, which is fair enough. Uh, we can have a whole yeah. conversation about them. But how are they related to the yeah. constitutional imagination that you point to as the, the holy trinity, human rights, democracy, <laughs> and uh, the rule of law, which, as we all know, made their appearance at least explicitly, and imagination sometimes needs a semantic anchor, but they made their apparition as, Co as Copenhagen criteria mm -hmm. for, you know, enlargement. Yeah, originally. Which and, and indeed, they're, as we know, they're at the fringe of EU competence anyway. And they're not, they're somewhat related, but not entirely to what you give us as policy prescriptions. So here's this gap. Mm. Now, there are many things that we could say about this gap, but the one thing I'd like to say or suggest is that European imagination has often been a, an EU utopia that is about the kind of Europe we want the foreigners to see us, the rest of the world to see us as developing. And then we gaze at that vision that they have of us or should have of us, and we try to become as, as they would want us to be. And that's a bit the, the, the Holy Trinity thing, um, because we don't do it. We don't, we don't enforce or argue or yeah. know, over the Trinity within Europe. I mean, that's the whole conversation we've had in the last day and a half. Take a final one before you get a chance, uh, Mark. Yes, uh, I'll start by saying that in terms of principles, I would subscribe to most of what you said. The problem is not, is probably the disagreement we could have is uh, when we shift from the terms of principle to the structures that uh, concretize the principles. Because I, I would subscribe to an idea of a European Union based uh, on on uh, the principles you were advocating for. But we think, I think we should discuss how those principles then play out in uh, shaping the competencies of the European Union. You were making a strong argument in favor of centralization in the end of your talk. And uh, I was wondering how you would uh, uh, defend, or if you defend the current uh, credentials of the European Union, for instance, to impose uh, uh, the, a relocation system on immigration in the countries. Do you think that the current procedures that we have provide the sufficient uh, uh, legitimacy to ask uh, uh, either the Bulgaria or Czech Republic or Italy either to retain this, the current situation or to change and to have some relocation? Do you think that is sufficient or do we need uh, uh, other types of uh, uh, competencies or other types of policy strategies to mm -hmm. achieve that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I'm afraid that principles are a vague uh, rhetoric that serve to convey more centralization without discussing the, the, mm -hmm. the structures that up, up until now have more corroded rather than reinforced the type of democracy we used to have at the national level. Mm -hmm. 
I think we'll give it over to you for some brief response to this. You can add to your bulk of actors, the economists, they also have an imagination about Europe. Yeah. <laughs> so let, so let's, let's, let's make that the first point. So yeah. you're absolutely right. In my presentation right now, when I describe the 90s um, uh, as, as the mainstreaming of, uh, of, of the EU among lawyers, I should have made that more general and said it's the mainstreaming of the EU amongst various types of scholarly enterprises, uh, uh, academics, academic practices, including political sciences and including philosophers. Uh, so this is now, so, but the point is it's an academic pursuit. These are, these, this is the academy that, uh, that is t beginning to take seriously and engage with and think about the EU. It's not yet uh, the wider world of uh, citizens. Um, so I accept the, uh, the lawyer-centric charge and, and, uh, and ex expand on that, but limited to the academy uh, primarily and certain kind of interest groups and, uh, and technocrats, etc. cetera. Um, now, uh, Calypso, um, I think there is no, the, the gap, the EU foundation, human rights, democracy, rule of law, and then actually what it does, you know, policy across a wide range of, range of areas, typically not so much uh, in focused on the things that are claimed to be the foundation uh, of uh, EU law in Article 2. The core point, and this is why this, uh, the, uh, gene the genealogy of this, of the art Article 2, as the Copenhagen accession criteria mm -hmm. makes this clear, is that this isn't about the EU as, the, as an organization. This is about how we should imagine legitimate authority in Europe. So it's about the states. It's about the transformation uh, of how we understand law and legitimate law uh, in Europe. It's, we, it's not just about the institution. The institution just articulates uh, kind of at the top, uh, if you like, um, the nature of who we are uh, and how we should think of law uh, within the larger community. So the real work needs to be done on the level of the states. They need to be uh, properly constituted liberal constitutional democracies. What it means for the European Union to meet those criteria is, is contested and is tough and, you know, they're different uh, so that's that's the that's a that's where we need to struggle Th that's where there's that's where there's legitimate struggle we don't know we have a certain kind of an, we have we have arrangements as they are but those arrangements this is also now this is now the Jan's question the arrangements that we have are arrangements that we can rightly criticize in the name of the foundational constitutional principles so with other words we can say the European Central Bank as it currently operates in conjunction with the way we allocate competencies with regard to fiscal and social policy uh, leads to a situation where there is a structural imbalance in the sense that certain groups are prioritized and, uh, and certain uh, economic actors are privileged to the detriment of others. This type of criticism uh, is one that ultimately employs um, the sensibilities of a constitutional uh, tradition which is anti-domination, uh, which, which, uh, which ensures uh, that there are structures that can be justified to all of us bound and living within them as free and equals. So with other words, even though we have a concrete institutionalized structure, some kind of a constitutional system, any concrete positive system is always from within the system itself, criticizable in name of the more abstract principles uh, that it claims um, uh, to be grounded in. Now that claim may often be hypocritical, um, but instead of, you know, there is a positive tradition which is ridiculous in this regard, which, which mis misunderstands uh, constitutionalism, which says, well, there are abstract principles, but, uh, but as lex specialis we have this institution. No, not lex specialis, the other way around. There are founding principles, and we have to interpret mm -hmm. and think about the more concrete institutional structures as concretizations of those principles. And if we can't, if there is no plausible link to be made, then we have to call them out as hypocritical and, 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 um, and as requiring reform, either through judicial interpretation and sometimes just through political acts and to political reforms. So that's how the emancipatory um, works within constitutionalist thought. The foundational principles provide a critical foil um, to be used to assess more concrete institutionalized orders and practices. And it's in line with that, and now I come to Marco, it's in line with that, that the, the aspects I've highlighted, um, the structure of, uh, of the banking, uh, of, the, of, the, of the monetary union, um, and social and fiscal policy, 
um, the, refu the refugees issues, the border issues, and the foreign policy structures. They are all, they are all um, aspects of existing practices which can be criticized as undermining the idea of allowing for collective action, non-domination uh, among uh, for European citizens. It's, it's, it's these points which, which point, there are failures there. We can, we can critically analyze existing structures in all of these regards and probably very plausibly come to the conclusion that existing structures fail us in that respect. Now what exactly the remedy is, uh, that is g a genuine political question to be struggled over. I have my own views and I pointed the direction uh, of them, but that's, that's, that's not, you know, I can't, as, that's as an, all I can point to as a constitutionalist is say, here are, here's a pathology, here's a problem, and it needs some kind of fixing, uh, but now we need, uh, we need the kind of political process, um, it may be a constitutional moment of sorts. So um, is which it a political question or is it a constitutional question? How we frame the competency? So that's a false dichotomy. Um, so of course constitutional questions uh, are sometimes also political questions. So um, co constitutional moments we know are political moments. Uh, that's at least traditionally we believe that now actually in contemporary constitution giving practices courts even play a role there. Um, so even there the, uh, the, the allocation of competence between different actors gets more complicated. But pr in principle um, the fact that something that, uh, that you have a constitutionalist critique, it can be a critique uh, which in part can be articulatable before a court, hoping that the court will interpret um, a particular institutional arrangement or competencies or a right in a certain way. Um, but it can also be a more fundamental critique, which, could, which is one that a court could not appropriately address. Uh, so it would be a critique uh, where you invoke the principles and you point to the pathology and make the argument that the concrete institution does not meet the, our own commitments that we have constitutionalized, and yet a court could not provide a remedy. Thank you. How many more hands did I have? Two more. So briefly, please, because we're running out of time for this first part. I go first? Okay. okay. Brief. Matthias. <laughs> constitutional imagination, the internal link between imagining the European Union and the constitutional imagination. Couldn't we spell this out more clearly by saying the European Union is a liberal project? It's part of liberalism, and therefore constitutionalism has to be at its center. The European Union is not ideologically neutral, which explains also why it's difficult and not, and, and you may have doubts, <coughs> to characterize the European Union as a project of emancipation. If you stick to the old-fashioned idea that, well, liberalism emancipates you from traditional feudal constraints, yeah, and the old constraints that you had in the economy, like monopolies and so forth, yeah, makes everything more competitive, then it's a project of emancipation, but it's a project of emancipation for those who are agile and well-educated. It's not a project for those who understood emancipation in the way it has been understood since the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, namely that's a project of decommodification of human life. It has not contributed to the decommodification of human life at all. From that perspective, from that angle, the European Union is definitely not a project of emancipation. Final point, and then I conclude. You've identified correctly and beautifully the challenges lying ahead for the European Union, and you've mentioned border controls, Everything that has to do with economic governance and, and fiscal governance, security and, and, and external security. These are all matters of crisis management. These are all matters that by their very nature have to be given into the hands of an executive body. So, constitutionalizing the European Union in this respect means conferring more power on the executive branch. So the European Union will more tilt it towards the executive branch in the future. How would the European people ever be able to accept it? I think there's only one solution. The, the source of the legitimacy must, uh, shouldn't, should, cannot, cannot be the people. So it must come from a different source. The European Union needs to be transformed into a monarchy. Only then will we have such a strong executive. Well, <laughs>
<laughs> well, let me, let me just. <laughs> at, at least that would not be a significant change, given that a, a significant minority of states in the European Union is already a monarchy. But do you see the problem? Yeah? Yeah. It's all it's about executive yeah. power. Yeah? Augustine, did you have a uh, two comment? points? Ah. The, the first one is on this question of the, the period, the history, and so on. Sorry for being the federalist around this table, but the case for European federalism was intensely politically debated in the interwar period in the UK, leading to spe uh, Penguin Special 46 carry the case for, fe for federal union. Mm -hmm. this, this was intensively debated and all through. So yeah, that was before the, the European Commission. The lawyer centric yeah. uh, perspective is okay as long as it's the constitutional imagination of lawyers, but not for the rest. The rest mm -hmm. is much bigger. Mm -hmm. And they, no, it is. No, well, no. that's our answer. This is, this, is not <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is self centric, uh, mm -hmm. I would say, if we are lawyers. The second question is the Tony Yard question. And it's a difficult one to put. But there is a point at which the, the image that you create through imagination cloaks reality. And there is a problem with the method of which we imagine things. And unfortunately, I keep on seeing on the second part of your, of your argument. Because the gap between the kingdom of ends and reality is so big that you end up cloaking reality. With migration policy, sorry to say, the refugee policy, I don't see existing practices that are related to the principles that you are pointing to. Mm. I see outsourcing of yeah. the migration yeah. crisis. So by saying that the practices are underpinned by these principles, sorry, you are cloaking reality. No, but I'm we not should, saying that. We should, we should be consoled. That. No, we cannot simply argue away problems. I think this is very important. Practically. I don't know why no, completely okay. wrong orientation. C can I just finish? The, the key question here is that you, you can make going back and forth between principles and rules and rules and principles and this kind of stuff. I'm not naturally inclined to legal positivism as such. <laughs> but there is a redeeming factor of the legal positivist that he explains what the rules are. And if he takes seriously what the rules are, he will now there is nothing more potentially critical than to describe EU law as it is. And uh, brief comments to yeah. these. <laughs> so, but just, just, obviously, just to clarify, the core point of constitutionalism, as I laid it out and understand it, <coughs> is that it allows you to get, gives you the resources to criticize exactly the practices that you rightly mentioned that are, have nothing to do, uh, that can't be justified, that are in clear tension with the grounding, what the EU claims are its founding principles, uh, to point that out and make it a, t a point, not just as a little, as a general political point, as saying, I don't find these policies good policies. You know, people disagree about policies. You can now say it is against our foundational commitments that we have inscribed in our constitution. That's a different powerful angle uh, to bring up against um, uh, these kinds of practices. So. You know, so it's not cloaking. On the contrary, this type of constitutionalist thinking allows you uh, to critically reflect on and criticize existing practices in the name of the commitments that we have already made. So that's something quite powerful uh, and has historically, in all kinds of contexts, I don't want to go there now, uh, been sh has shown itself to make a difference uh, in political terms. You are right also about the pre-war debates and debates in the 40s, in the, in the 46, 47, 40, so in the, uh, in the 40s there were debates about federal Europe and all kinds of other ideas uh, of Europe. It was kind of a very imaginative moment uh, for thinking about the future because it seemed quite open. Um, but, and I, so there's nothing I want, so you're absolutely right about that, but that's not a period of the history which involves the European community as it, uh, in, in its concrete form. So I, my account simply started at a later point. So if you wanted to kind of embed my account in a larger historical account, it would include uh, that part uh, in it, and I would acknowledge it. But from the moment it actually got going, it had the type of structure I believe that I presented. Now, um, Sasha, um, constitutionalism is emancipation from domination. 
so the idea of the French American Revolution is free and equal self government. It's emancipation uh, from domination, which can take different forms. One form it may take uh, is an economic commodification oriented one, and that has played a central role in the history. Uh, of emancipatory thought, and of both, particularly, of course, in the Marxist tradition. But of course, I'm not a Marxist. I think Marx, Marx grossly exaggerated by its, his reductive account mm -hmm. of freedom, uh, tying it basically exclusively or close to exclusively to the economic sphere. Uh, that was an exaggeration. I don't believe in that. Mm -hmm. I think it but plays. The point is to overcome that. Uh, right. the, yeah, the point is to overcome that. That's very important. It is a central part. There's no question about that. But it's not the only part. So the problem with uh, feudalism is not only it, the limits of economic opportunity and the kind of structures, domination it, it places in the economic sphere. It, it's, it's, it's a wider idea uh, of freedom that it's incompatible with. And if we connect the European Union in that regard uh, with uh, the, an idea of emancipation, even when it comes to the economic sphere, mm -hmm. is it really all that implausible to suggest that um, National boundaries, in some contexts, um, are ways of protecting uh, certain industries to the detriment uh, of uh, citizens otherwise seeking good services, uh, etc., and having access to them more cheaply. Um, so I'm, I think there's something deeply troubling about, uh, about a general rejection of even the fundamental ideas. You don't have to be an auto-liberal, and certainly not a neoliberal, uh, to believe that there may be actually something worthwhile in uh, in, in diminishing the significance of borders in economic life. Um, so, the EU, what the EU does, it creates the tools to do that on the basis of decisions made in directives and regulations um, um, and requiring justifications of national actors under the four freedoms. So, it, it basically creates a framework which allows actors to contest uh, b um, limitations uh, imposed uh, uh, on this, but that doesn't mean there are to be no boundaries and that you can't uh, enact social policies or po uh, political policies as a general matter. It just provides a framework that allows us to contest uh, these things and thereby, in principle at least, expands the capacity for collective action. And that is something emancipatory, even if some of its concrete forms may themselves now take forms of domination. That I accept. Uh, so, but to the extent that we analyze these forms of new forms of domination, then we can criticize them in the name of exactly the principles which undergird the project in the first place.